All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of Munch and Learn. Um, just a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, next week is third Thursday. So um, we have our free yoga class as well as our hobby kickstarts special. It is going to be facilitated by one of our, who is an artist artist, Shamika Carter, who will be uh, teaching in class on earring making. So if that's something that would interest you, um, please sign up. We still have some spaces. Um, and now I would like to, and also uh, this Saturday, um, May 14th is our family day from 10 to 2 p.m. And Sunday at 2 p.m. is our opening lecture for the Sweet 16 exhibit, which will feature Kevin Sharp, Julie Perotti, Teresa Cunningham, and Margarita Sandino. So now, without further ado, uh, we'll introduce our today's speaker, um, Kate Roberts, who is our current Wurzberger artist, um, is an assistant professor of art at the University of Memphis in Tennessee. She received both her MFA and BFA from the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. Her work has been exhibited in numerous museums, including the Tampa Art Museum, Frick Museum in Pittsburgh, and Everson Museum in Syracuse, New York. She has created large institute ceramic installations and major exhibitions, such as the Parkour Ceramic uh, Croquet Biennial in Geneva, Switzerland, and the Korean International Ceramic Biennial in South Korea. Kate, thank you so much for being here with us today. Right. So this is nice because this is not a lot of pressure. Not a <laughs> view, which I'm really happy about. Um, so, anyways, uh, thank you all for coming out today. Um, I know it's lunchtime. You're probably really hungry. Maybe you got a snack. Um, but, anyways, I just uh, I want to start by thanking the Dixon for their invitation to create a show, and um, and to also show this new body of work. Um, and also for the opportunity to talk about my practice that's kind of led to this exhibition echoes that's right out there, right out those doors. So in preparing this talk, I thought about moments when I've had to pivot um, to rethink what I make, how I make it, um, my responsibility to it. Um, and this has led to me practicing or exposing acts of vulnerability. So this started with initially my choice in the material of clay um, and my process of transforming it. So one of the most common descriptions of a ceramic piece is that it's fragile. Uh, I've always had a need to push the idea of fragility to the extreme. And I continue to do that today. So using clay as a material that essentially comes from this, the ground um, has become a way for me to talk about the moments of vulnerability we see around us. So I grew up um, in the Southern part of the United States, specifically Greenville, South Carolina, um, which is close to the Appalachian Mountains or near Asheville, and where I was surrounded by this kind of lush and bountiful landscape that's very similar um, to this series of Southern landscape photographs by fellow Southerner and photographer Sally Mann. And it's an environment that embraces the viewer, but at the same time is hauntingly visceral. Uh, this is due, I believe, to the area's humidity, which we are getting a sneak peek of um, this week, and it causes the pace to be slow, sometimes nearly stagnant, and time does not move in a linear fashion, but is suspended. So as Southerners, we live in suspension between myth and truth, between appearance and reality, between life and death, um, and between the past and the present. And so in my work, I try to find that moment, that similar moment in between, creating work that kind of teeters on this edge. So also growing up in the South introduced me to clay, so uh, which has become primarily my material of obsession for the last almost 20 years now. And my first introduction to ceramics was that of the face jug. And the one on the left is unknown, circa 1862-1870. And then the one on the right is by yours truly, uh, myself, age 12. And I fell in love with this material at a really young age. It's just dirt, but its ability to be manipulated into anything has kept my attention. So it can be hard, it can be soft, wet, vitreous, and all of these qualities can come together to make a beautiful piece. 
So the medium walks the line every time we put it in the kiln, or in my case, as of late, um, not. So as of late, I have not been firing work. Um, it has become for me that perfect medium um, to find that moment in between. So sight is, has become a starting point for much of my work that I create. Uh, the work, the first work I made that explored sight was my graduate thesis show. So however, I don't think I completely understood why uh, I wanted to explore sight at the time, other than to see my work, um, I was creating a different context. I chose to have my graduate thesis show in a decaying post office um, in this kind of smaller town, which is an even smaller town to the town of Alfred, New York. Um, and so you're looking at the entrance to the space. So I considered what once was and drew inspiration from its pink marble floors and the mint green paint chips that were cast on the ground. So I focused um, a lot of this body of work on the idea of surface. So I studied the surfaces with an intense desire to understand how they became what they are. So how nature, time, circumstance can alter our perception. And the large space, this large space would have been where they would have sorted clay, or clay, <laughs> where they would have sorted the mail. <laughs> um, and uh, so it was, uh, and there was kind of some interesting areas in this space, um, particularly there's some windows that you can kind of see in the top right. And that's where the postmaster would have like watched over people. Um, and that ended up being this like perfect place to kind of light in this space. There was only one plug in this entire space. So trying to move extension cords everywhere um, was an, a very interesting um, exercise. So the space, um, the floor was uneven due to water damage. And so with that in mind, I created these puddles that appeared to be slowly moving in one direction. So a single light referenced the moon. I used pieces of debris that I collected from failed projects to prop up the surface. So I saw these as fossils. So these were all kind of like remnants of pieces that I had made in graduate school that I had kind of like made, like beat them up and, you know, and kind of then used them as this thing that was like holding up this surface that was there. So as people walked around the pieces on the ground, there was this tension in the air. So one misstep and the stillness could cease to exist. And then what is underneath would be revealed. And so of course, um, your like family member is the one who like steps on it. So like my dad was the one who like, everybody's really quiet and there's like nobody talking and he like steps on the whole thing. So anyways, then I was like, this is my dad right here instead. So uh, nature has always played a leading role conceptually in my work. I grew up in South Carolina and there's kudzu everywhere as there is here in Memphis too. So I find it to be beautiful despite its ability to completely overtake anything in its path. There is this push and pull between nature and humanity. I love the similarities between the softness cast by the invasive plant and the inside of a decaying theater in Detroit. Though made of out of different materials, both exude a vulnerability, a moment of release. So Miss Havisham's beauties were inspired by this observation. So in the entrance of the post office, I placed a series of topiaries. These were also inspired by a vase of dead flowers that's traveled with me from studio to studio. It actually perished in my last studio in Seattle. I was not allowed to bring it here to Memphis. Um, so I've started a new base of dead flowers here in Memphis. Um, and over time, the remnants of the studio had gathered on these dried petals and like webs were stretched from one surface to another. And topiaries are iconic of palaces and mansions by altering their appearance with this accumulated fiber and slip. It's a reminder for me that nature does not discriminate Items symbolic of wealth, status, and grandeur are not safe from nature's wrath. The fiber hangs and wraps itself around the flowers and vase, trapping these remnants of life. After graduate school, my work took a bit of a pivot. And I think it's because I had been moving so much and I was really interested in not kind of collecting things anymore. 
um, because every time I would move, I would end up kind of throwing some work away or, or giving it away to people. Um, and so, you know, since then, actually, since kind of leaving graduate school, my practice has been dedicated to understanding the limits of clay in its many stages from dust to wet slip to unfired. And so during graduate school, I began to add these kind of unfired elements uh, to pieces. However, the final product was primarily uh, fired. Though the pieces were fragile, they were missing this kind of direct material investigation and impermanence. And I started building in this way as well because I was interested in the possibility of arriving at a site with a toolbox of materials and building a piece in situ. So pass gates were built in my studio and then transported to their final lo location. So this is Gate to Nowhere um, and it was commissioned as part of the 15th Parcours or Ceramic Carouge in Carouge, Switzerland. And it was built in the Allée de la Fonderie uh, which is a building in decay and it had been set for demolition. I have no idea if they finally demolished it because it was such a great building for these art installations to happen in. Um, and the piece kind of echoed the circumstances of that building. So as it was suspended between this kind of life and death. Prior to beginning a gate, I often research gate designs within the area they will be installed. So the gate was inspired by this gate at Lake Lugano in Switzerland. And I took the title for the piece from the nickname for this gate, which was Gate to Nowhere. Um, basically, you know, it was this gate that was where they, you know, dock, uh, ships would dock or, or boats would dock on there. Um, but anyways, uh, gates have this symbol in my work to discuss this moment in between. So they symbolize a separation or a threshold between two forces. So they can dictate a split between class, race, wealth, beliefs, and territory. And each uh, gate examines this temporary physicality and meaning of these objects and spaces. So the installation questions the gate's permanence. So by leaving the clay unfired, it no longer has the ability to contain or protect its vulnerability unmasked. So um, they're built using these long fiber mixed with porcelain slip um, that slowly built up on fishing line. And in making these large installations, I've enjoyed the ability to make decisions, not just intuitively, but instantly. So if something were to kind of um, fall or break or something like that, I can kind of like work off of that as I'm continuing to build on it. And so I'm really, I really love that kind of opportunity to do that. So one of the very reasons I began working in unfired clay is the understanding that at the very end of an exhibition, the suspended porcelain would be cut down and recycled with the hope that its material would be reused to make more pieces. So ultimately, each piece's life uh, during an exhibition hangs somewhere in between. So Gate to Nowhere was displayed for one week, where at the end of the exhibition, it was cut down. And so this was kind of a ceremonial, this was the end to the entire conference that was happening. And so um, they did kind of a ceremonial kind of cutting down of the gate itself. Um, so when I while, in starting, while installing Gate to Nowhere, I met um, Karin Bloomgren and Ernest Bulladotter, who were from Sweden and Iceland, respectively. And they were installing this piece downstairs. And at lunch daily, our kind of discussions usually ended up around how sight became the impetus for their work they were creating. And this is not a new idea, but it really changed my methods of considering the locations um, and how I choose and how I respond to them. So this was a piece that they made down um, downstairs in the basement. So it's called Inundation. It was um, based on these landslides that they had been seeing happening. So the piece was like physically coming towards you and was kind of bringing everything its way. Um, and I just really loved the way that they kind of built with this, um, this ferocity, you know, they were just so, so, um, so smart about the way that they built this thing too. Um, and so when I started working on an installation for a gallery in Seattle, I really focused on site and material colliding. So I was drawn to this gallery in particular because it had remnants of the past inhabitants of the building. 
So sections of the tile floor were still there from the former grocery store, as well as patches of these ornate ceiling tiles. And Seattle is also a city that's terrain is constantly changing. So with older buildings being torn down to make one room for taller ones. And so um, this piece explored the concept of the changing landscape. So dust became the material of choice after reading a Cyprian Galliard quote in an interview called New Romantic in Conversation with Jonathan Griffin. And he says, I see buildings falling in Glasgow. I see rubble. I asked myself where that rubble goes. I discovered it's crushed and then used to build new pedestrian streets. So people are walking on ghost of tower blocks. And I thought this image was really potent and kind of directly linked to what was happening in Seattle at the time too. So as one image began to recede, another one was emerging as the clay dust passed through these kind of round sieves that I had made. Well, actually I did not make the round sieves, but <laughs> um, I hired somebody, my metal work is not so good. <laughs> um, and then, I also included this image of a dissected column um, and it became another way moments of fragmentation could act as a metaphor for change and permanence and a device for reinterpretation. So the tool fabric became a sieve or filtration device for the dust. And this is just a kind of close up of the end of one. So these were, I mean, these are basically like screens that for kind of windows that I had used. Um, so research of a specific location and its surrounding areas is now one of the ways that I began. So my father-in-law grew up in Pittsburgh and we often have conversations about how the loss of the steel industry negatively affected the economy of the area and but positively improved the air quality and the environment. And so I drew from these conversations in creating this installation laced in the town of Braddock, which is outside of Pittsburgh. And I continue to explore the use of this tool fabric um, as a filtration device. We're also exploring methods of perspective. So the piece acted as one large accordion filter. And for one, from one angle, you saw these buildings obscured by smog. And then the other direction, you saw the city landscape being slowly wiped away. So just depending on your perspective. Right. Um, so in front of the larger filter was a grouping on the floor of porcelain ginkgo leaves. And there's this ginkgo tree on my way to work that I absolutely love looking at in the fall. Um, and its leaves turn, you know, this vibrant yellow and they all fall at once and uh, creating this kind of blanket around the stump. And so ginkgo trees are also one of the only trees that can thrive in polluted places. So they are a small reminder of life and beauty when everything else is so dark. So um, a couple summers ago, I was visiting my parents and this huge tree fell over in my neighbor's uh, or in their neighbor's yard behind them. So this actually, I think this was right during the pandemic. So the summer of the pandemic. And um, at the base was all this clay. And so naturally I decided to go harvest a numerous buckets full of this clay. And I brought them back to the studio. Um, unfortunately, there were like many, many hills I had to go up in order to take, I mean that you can see the hill right there. I had to take it all the way back up that hill um, in order to get it back to, into the car and back to Memphis. Um, so in South Carolina, the clay is really red and a lot of it is mostly full of sand for the most part, um, which is kind of one of the reasons why it's a bit hard to grow some things in it too. Um, so I brought it back to my studio and I dried it out and I ground it up and I started testing it for kind of, you know, for its color and thinking about um, the possibility of using it for some future dust paintings. So this then led to me to start collecting local clay here in Memphis. So I worked with a geologist at the university at, to find sites around the city. And you can find it by the side of the by the side of highways, um, river sources. Shelby Neiman Forest has some along trails, um, and this was a really great way to continue experimenting, kind of during the quarantine when we were like the only place we were able to do is like get outside. And so this became kind of like a project for me in that time. 
And with it being hard to travel also in 2020, as well as create kind of installations on site, I found myself sourcing imagery and research from what I was seeing online. So specifically the wildfires that were happening uh, on the West Coast. And I was absorbed by the pictures taken showing these massive destru destruction and also how signs of it traveled to the East Coast as well. So there had been, um, I believe, I think it was in Massachusetts and some places, there were also some places where people were talking about how the smog had kind of completely, you know, crossed the country and they were finding it um, over there. Um, and so I, I thought that that was such an interesting thing of this kind of butterfly effect or this, where something traveled from one place all the way over, you know, thousands of miles. And so some of the photographs reminded me of the romantic landscapes by Albert uh, Beardstadt of the same valleys that were affected. And so the effect of a sunrise, so this was a sunrise, um, was replaced now by the smoky uh, haze of the smoldering landscape. And I revisited ideas of filtration of dust and layering of images to create these smoked out landscapes. So mirroring them, uh, disintegrating, them through multiple layers, and in some cases, abstracting them. And also, you know, some of them were, were eerily familiar and haunting. You know, for instance, this image for these pieces came from Southern Oregon. And however, this same scene reminded me so much of like a fog on a crisp morning in the Appalachian Mountains. So it, the, the kind of like, the idea that these two places kind of existed in tandem, but were completely under different situations. And um, I also installed, I installed this one kind of like a triptych. So this was installed in New York City. And I liked that relationship between the city landscape with the, with the relationship with the mountains too at the same time, and how um, many of these things kind of affected each other. And the more abstracted pieces, uh, they kind of read to me like scars or bruises. So, you know, this was some where I was kind of starting to take some images into Photoshop and kind of mirroring them or reflecting them onto each other. So displaced, replaced was a, the first installation I've done in Memphis. So last year I was invited by 2021 projects to install uh, a work in their pop-up gallery space. And, and I just spent the summer kind of regrading my backyard and the dirt that was dumped on my driveway ended up being mostly out of clay and a variety of colors of clay too at the same time. So, um, you know, that dirt that was kind of delivered is called fill dirt. Oops, let me go back to this. Fill dirt, which usually comes from construction sites. So it occurred to me that none of the clay was kind of truly local. So the idea of like local, you know, something being local, everything is constantly being kind of like regraded or redistributed or, you know, um, and I even had a conversation, I guess it was a couple months ago now of a lady who started like, who was close to the Great Lakes and started testing her clay and realized that clay or that soil had come from at least 200 or 300 miles away. So the idea of like something being local is constantly changing. Um, it's obviously in flux. So the 2021 project space had this unusual slope to it. And it also had signs of where the entrance to the building originally had been. And I decided to level what would have been the entrance before. So you can kind of see in this, the picture to the uh, right, you can see those, there's like these two at the top, there's these two kind of um, concrete stones, and that would have been the original entrance to this building at the time. So, um, and then, you know, everything else was kind of at this slope, um, the rest of the place. And so I made, um, I made my own tampers, which, so this is me kind of like taking some of that dirt from home um, and I made these, these were porcelain tampers, which um, in theory <laughs> sounded like a great idea, but um, remember clay is fragile. <laughs> so of course that all this, you know, our ceramics is fragile. So of course um, they, you know, they cracked a little bit. So then I had to bring in the metal tamper. So, um, but anyways, uh, I have this idea that, you know, that this, this uh, 
clay piece would kind of take on some of the colorant from the clay itself. So it would kind of um, almost like dye the clay body through the process of doing this, which it did. Um, it also broke. <laughs> so, oops, here we go. Um, and so there's a, there are the two uh, tampers that I had made kind of sitting next to there. But the, this wall faced west. And so um, the piece in the back, so that was another dust piece. And that was of a Memphis sunset. So sunsets and, you know, sunsets in general are created, you know, there's these things that are so beautiful, but they're actually created from pollution, which is such an unfortunate, you know, kind of echoing effect that we get from them. And so, um, and so this was an actual kind of a picture that I had taken of a Memphis sunset. And then um, directly after displaced and replaced came down, I installed the dirt in this oval shape in response to the lake that had been referenced in this earlier dust painting, those two that you see in the back back there. So um, each time this clay is reinstalled, it kind of collects something from the previous location. So at 2021 projects, it collected sequins from Brittany Boyd Bullock's fiber pieces. Um, and then the next iteration collected seeds that I had planted and then let perish throughout the duration of the show. So the dirt continues to kind of move with me too. Um, it was recently, it was in my studio. I just had her finished a residency at Crosstown, which is where I made all the work um, in the show back there. Um, and now it's in my home studio awaiting <laughs> another thing. It's really nice if you are able though to um, move the dirt from one location to the next and never have to collect it back <laughs> in your own space. But, um, but anyways, this, uh, what I like about the idea that it's collecting, you know, it's once again, that whole idea of it never being like local, you know, that it's going to constantly kind of collect whatever that environment that it exists in, and we'll take it to the next place that it goes to. So um, I love that idea. And so now I want to talk a little bit about the show, um, show out these doors right now. So um, the, the show echoes and at last, late last fall, I was approached by the Dixon to create work for an exhibition in the galleries. And Patty Daigle, who was here for a hot minute, um, she came to my studio and did a studio visit. And this piece um, was in my studio. And this piece actually was made in March 2020 for a show at the end. And we all know what happened in March of 2020. And so that show never happened. And that piece kind of sat there for a while. Um, mostly because it never really, I never could find a way that it um, spoke to any of the other kind of exhibitions that I was working on at that time. And so when, um, when Patty was looking at this work, she was like, well, you know, this reminds me a lot of the, a lot of the work that is within the Dixon, a lot of these landscape paintings that are within the Dixon. And so this piece had actually been made for um, a show that was supposed to be in Richmond, Virginia. And I had Originally, um, I thought this painting that I had found was of Richmond, Virginia. But then I recently, upon um, us kind of taking and going and going to look at this, this is actually Manchester. Um, so there's a lot of things that like kind of came into play as I was uh, looking through that. But anyways, I, this is the original painting. And, and I took this and I did do a little bit of kind of like moving some stuff around, but mostly what I was interested in was, you know, this is mid 19th century. This is when industrialization was happening. All of these like plants were being put into place. All of this kind of like pollution was happening in the air and nobody was really thinking about it. You know, it was just kind of like, oh, okay. Like this is the product of that. And so um, now, you know, it's not just this problem but there's many multiple problems that are now affecting a lot of what we're dealing with now. And so I was thinking about how these things kind of echoed forward um, or the way that we might, what we live in right now is kind of an echo from the past or some of our choices that we made in the past. So. Um, this, you know, at the time, this show that I was in was kind of all about um, darkness. So the choice of the color came from that at the same time. But there's a lot of things that kind of happened um, since then. But, but what I had started to do is take those kind of those screens where I had tried to make those screens where they were kind of layered, and I compressed them. So 
And the idea that this became a big filter, that this image kind of passed through or that the dust got caught in. So that's some tool fabric that the dust was kind of collected in. And so that led to, um, as I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for this show, um, like I said before, you know, I start with sight um, for the most, most part. And as I kind of was looking at this site, um, the collection became the site of choice and the collection became what I wanted to draw from. So I picked, um, I started off with the, um, the catalog, the printed catalog, and was kind of looking through there. And then um, there's some really wonderful things now because a lot of these paintings that I am referencing are actually up in these shows right now, which is a really, and some of those were no, like I knew afterwards and some of them, um, I had no idea was I was picking these, some of these paintings. Like for instance, I came in the other, you know, during the opening a couple of weeks ago. And one of the paintings that I picked was like, it's like way up or no, I think it's over top in the back, back there, like right underneath, um, the projector. And I was like, Oh, okay. That was one of the ones that I had picked in the, in deciding to do these. So as I was thinking about this collection, I was thinking about, you know, 1830s, you know, or mid 19th century, there was this kind of, you know, maybe at the time there hadn't been this thought that some of these places might change or they might be altered by some of our choices that we make. And so I started to take um, mix those images, so those paintings, and then started to overlay them with some imagery from contemporary imagery that was either from pollution or forest fires. Um, and so for instance, the image in the bottom right, that is what I kind of used part of that haze and then placed it over top of. And what I'm saying by that is I took the painting, put it in Photoshop, um, took the image that's on the bottom, placed it on top of it on Photoshop and just changed the opacity of it. So all of a sudden there became this kind of filter. So also thinking about how we are placing filters on a lot of things, just even on Instagram or anything like that, we're kind of constantly, you know, changing or altering our perception of something like that. But through this, um, talking about that in terms of um, these images. So, you know, this is another um, painting. I don't think this one is on view right now. But um, once again, I'm showing you the image that I've kind of collected from that. And I, a lot of these images, um, I picked primarily sometimes for composition or sometimes kind of moods that I was wanting to create with them. So this one, you know, the one on the bottom uh, right, that is the glow um, during the fires that were happening out west. That's the kind of glow that people would see day and night there. So this kind of really, I mean, it's hot and it's just like, um, it just, it feels apocalyptic too at the same time and to a place this other, this kind of filter now on top of something that um, was very idealized and idyllic setting, that's, that's a really interesting combination for me. And this was another one. So this came from the bottom left. I took um, not that entire um, photo, but I took sections of that smog that was on there and then placed it over top of these. And then once again, and this actually, I've used this image on the bottom right a couple of times, um, but I just thought it was such an interesting thing. Once again, it's composition based in terms of like, this is this lake, then we're dealing with Venice, you know, um, and so kind of overlaying these two, um, these two different atmospheres and uh, landscapes on top of each other. And then I just want to say thank you so much for coming out today. Um, and if you need any of my information, here it is. Um, you're more than welcome to contact me if you have more questions. But otherwise, I think if we have time for questions, um, I'm more than happy to answer anything based on this. Yes. Are you printing that from Photoshop on on paper and then overlaying it with the tool? Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming the tool you're putting dust, mud, dust. Dust. Yeah, mud. Dust. dust. Or are you putting mud? 
It's it's like dust. It's dust that's mixed with some glue okay. and a little water, so that it stays. Okay. And you know, and and um, it's yeah. Well, stays. Um, <laughs> that's another term to say too, because I was thinking about when we took uh, the biggest one. I was taking this one from cross down and we had to cross Cleveland and I could just see dust like <laughs> like exiting it as we were moving and I was I I really liked that idea too um and I know like you know that that speaks a lot to like that sense of impermanence too and that sense that it's going to change over time um and so when these have been shipped I mean this these haven't been shipped yet but when these have shipped, there is always a little bit of loss within them. So there's a little bit of the image showing up, not, I mean, they haven't been shipped enough that it's not there anymore at all, but it's constantly kind of going through this process of change. So yeah, no, so I print, I, um, I print them out like via like architectural uh, plans. So they're black and white. And then I have a piece of uh, plexiglass and then I place the piece of tool on top of that and kind of trace the image um, and then choose. So each it's a little bit like screen printing in a way, too, if you think about that, meaning like it's layers of color over top of each other. So all of those layers um, create the final kind of like image that you're looking at. Yeah. Oh, OK. Emily, I saw your hand first. Um, so with the layers that you have, do you see that as the kind of heat dispersed over the sites that you will be observing in the future, or is there a final concern about the heat? You know, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know, because each time, I mean, most, most of these installations that I've made so far with the, the dirt in terms of tamping it have been local, meaning like within Memphis. Um, so I have not had to take it with me somewhere else. And probably if that was the case, I would, um, if I was to do an installation somewhere else with some of this dirt, I would, um, I would probably try to locate it there locally in terms of bringing it into the site too. And thinking about, because the idea of displaced and replaced, you know, like taking it from wherever it look, wherever I'm digging it up and placing it into a, into a gallery, is also just different and odd, just thinking about those two different spaces and how we view them. Um, but I did, towards the end of the Crosstown residency, I used the laser cutter that they have there and I've been making some stamps. So I've been thinking a little bit more about how I might, instead of just tamping down and it being a flat surface, how I might make pattern on the um, surfaces too. So I've been thinking about ways that we, um, ways that we alter surfaces, um, whether, and the one that I've been stuck on right now is I've been looking at tire tracks for the most part, but I've been looking at, there's some like crazy tire tracks that are like very ornate looking and remind you of like filigree or remind you of something else, you know? And so I've been looking at those and all and tire tracks, they all mean something different. You know, it's about traction. It's, it's about, um, it's not all about aesthetics um, or at least, most of it's about traction, <laughs> but I think um, I think there is something really beautiful about the aesthetic of a tire track. All of a sudden, you would if you had asked me when I was in undergrad, I was just looking back um, today at some pieces that I had made in undergrad that were all these kind of florally, lacy type things. If you'd been like, yeah, in twelve years you're going to be really interested in tire tracks, I'd be like, oh, who are you talking to? So, yeah. Julie. Do you still, I know you teach, do you teach traditional ceramic? I do. Do you teach this? I teach both. I mean, I try to. <laughs> um, I believe in a, I, I believe in a foundation. Like I believe like you should, um, I believe you should kind of know some of the traditions within a material. And then I, so that's usually how like intro classes are for me is kind of teaching those traditions. Um, but I start to kind of introduce some of these things that are non-traditional within the process too. Um, and then I teach, I would say one of my favorite classes that I teach is called alternate processes in clay, which I throw everything out the window in that class. And, you know, I'm like, you thought you knew this material. You do not know this material. You've got to figure out, 
you know, how to use it. And so I love teaching that class because, well, first of all, I get, I get to watch other people experiment <laughs> too. And then it's like, it like, it's like in my mind, I'm like, oh, oh, I could do, okay. Oh, what if I did this instead? Or, you know, or other, where other processes from other students kind of start to merge. Like, that's what I really love too about that. Whatever they might've brought into, like I had a student use cyanotype um, on clay and then think, it, and then I was like, oh, okay. Well, how could I, you know? Um, so I'm not saying I'm stealing from them, but it's definitely getting my like brain going in like different ways that I might use some of those techniques. So yeah, I don't think I would be allowed to just teach <laughs> alternate processes in clay. I think there, I think there has to be some sort of foundation. Uh, oh, I think it was Christine next. <laughs> um, is there any particular reason why you use school or have you experimented with other fabrics also? You know, that's that's a good question. And that's one I've been thinking a lot more of since humidity is of the essence now that we're going into the summer months. Um, a tool tool was just kind of the, the first thing that I thought of in terms of something that still had a grid like structure, but was still see through. Um, and then I did start to look into um, like wire meshes that were more um, that were like for screen for screens. Um, I started looking at that, but it wasn't uh, see through enough for me at the time. So I'm still looking for that. I, I had a friend um, tell me that there are some industrial fabrics that can't, that they won't stretch quite as much. And so I'm on a lookout for those. So if you know of any, please, <laughs> because humidity is killing me. <laughs> you live in the wrong place. I know, I know, and that, yeah. Well, and it's funny because some, you know, the piece that um, you have to stretch these pieces in humidity, like, because then they'll like, you know, when it's not humid, they'll kind of like stretch, you know, compress back. And I'm learning that as a process. But unfortunately, we did not have enough humid days before this show went up for me to try to make sure that I was stretching in those conditions. So, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I also kind of amazed that the thinking mostly about the entire porcelain about the fragility of that and the, the risk involved in yeah. these pieces. And you know, I'm not sure how to ask the question, but you said a little bit in the show the Bruce you know, where about um this just going with the flow of things growth. Like, mm. like how hard did you push that and <laughs> teach your students to take those kinds of risks? Mm. Like, what's the edge in that? Um I don't, you know, that's a good question. I mean, that's, yeah. Um, I'm, I, <laughs> I feel, no, but I, I feel like we've learned a lot in these last two years about pivoting. Um, and so, and, and in that, that kind of was also something that I've followed a lot <laughs> beforehand too, but, um, but I'm, I'm always trying to, um, especially with students, trying to be like, okay, there's got to, you know, there has to be, I know this thing's falling apart, but there's got to be some parts of these pieces that you could still work with or that you could still think about in a different way. And so for me, it's always about changing perspective of the way that I might be looking at something. And yes, is there ever a time where something is starting to fall and I have to like, you know, just just like abort <laughs> mission or something like that, of course. <laughs> um, and actually, you know, some of the, um, yeah, no, I definitely had to do that before too. But I try, I, I probably, um, I, I, I probably more than often than I should um, try my best to make things work <laughs> um, and just kind of see them through, see them through. There, ha there hasn't, well, no, I can't say that. There have been times where I just been like, okay, that's not going to work. But I usually have like, I always think about this. I usually have at least one major breakdown in a show <laughs> where I'm like, this is not working. 
<laughs> and so, and I usually feel like you, <laughs> you always have that. And then you've got to like kind of push through it a little bit. And, and that's the thing that I think you have to teach the students too, is like, there's always going to be this moment where you're going to be like, okay, this is not what I thought this was going to look like at all. And then how do you, how do you make it what you want it to look like now? You know, how do you take those parts from that? But I think it's okay to cry in the middle of everything every once in a while and then move forward. So I am all for crying. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. All right. I think we're done. <laughs> All right, I'm going to eat. <laughs>